So hopefully you looked at the definition and recognized either from the equation q out over q out minus q in, or from just thinking about how the work and q in have to add up to q out, and so the work has to be less than q out, and that tells you that the denominator in the coefficient of performance must be less than the numerator. And so the coefficient of performance for heating is always greater than 1. For many people, when they first see this, it seems like there must be some physical law being broken and that this can't be possible. It seems like we're getting something for nothing, and thermodynamics generally doesn't allow that. So what's going on here? Why is it that no laws of thermodynamics are being broken? Well, first of all, check out the first law. What's sort of magical about a heat pump is that we get more heat out than the work we put in. But that's not a violation of the first law. The cleverness here is that we're also getting some heat to come along for the ride from the cold reservoir. So all of the energy checks out. But what about the second law? At first sight, you might think we're violating the second law because we're moving thermal energy from cold to hot. The second law tends to ensure that energy always gets more spread out. But this is concentrating energy. It's giving energy to things that already have lots, which seems like a violation of the second law. However, remember that the second law says that for an isolated system, entropy always increases or stays the same. This isn't an isolated system. In fact, even if we expand our system to include the hot and cold reservoirs, it's still not an isolated system because there's work being done on it. And so there's no violation of the second law here. So, heat pumps with coefficients of performance greater than 1 are absolutely fine, but let's just think about a heat pump that has a coefficient of performance exactly equal to 1. Well, this isn't really a heat pump, but we can think of it as one. If you just take some mass and pull it along the floor, so you do work on it, and let's consider our system to be the thing you're pulling and the floor under it, they're going to warm up because of friction. And then if you just wait long enough, all of that thermal energy you just produced is eventually going to radiate or conduct or convect out to the environment. And so if you wanted to, you can think of this as a heat pump, but it is the worst possible heat pump where there's no thermal energy in from a cold reservoir. And so this has a coefficient of performance of 1. Now, I want to stress, this isn't really a heat pump, but it's still useful to think about it as if it was one so that we can think about some other related things. So remember that a heat pump is a heat engine operating in reverse. So if we reverse this worst heat pump, what we actually get is what you might think of as the best possible heat engine, because it has an efficiency exactly equal to 1. All of the thermal energy in gets converted to work. So what would that look like? Let's think about reversing the process I just described. We would have to have our block. It would somehow absorb heat from the environment so it would warm up, and then it would have to convert that to work somehow, so it has to convert that thermal energy into mechanical energy, and so it would have to perhaps start spontaneously moving. Well, I hope you see that this violates the second law of thermodynamics. It's exactly like the case of our pendulum hanging in a box of gas, where the box of gas transfers energy to the pendulum and gets it moving. That's just so very, very, very unlikely that it will never happen. Okay, so this particular reverse process won't work to make a heat engine with efficiency 1. But what if we were really clever? This isn't telling us that there isn't any way to make a heat engine with efficiency 1. So let's imagine that we could and think about something we could do with it. So imagine we take our heat engine with an efficiency of 1 and we use it to drive a heat pump. So we're taking some energy in from the hot reservoir into the heat engine. All of that is converted to work, which is given to the heat pump, which transfers some thermal energy from the cold reservoir to the hot. But 
recognize that the net effect of all of this is just a flow of thermal energy from the cold reservoir to the hot. And if we define our system as the heat engine, the heat pump, the hot reservoir, and the cold reservoir, this is now an isolated system. And it's an isolated system where thermal energy is going from cold to hot, which is meaning this is evolving from more likely states to less likely states. And that is a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. So this, in fact, shows us that a heat engine with an efficiency of one is impossible because if any such thing existed, it would allow us to violate the second law of thermodynamics. Remember that heat engines aren't just made by people, they exist in nature too, and so statements about heat engines are pretty fundamental to physics. And so this is often used as an alternate statement of the second law of thermodynamics. It's called the Kelvin-Planck statement. And it says that it is impossible for a process to exist which takes in a quantity of heat from a single heat reservoir and converts all of it to work. Or to put it more simply, no heat engine can have a thermodynamic efficiency of one. But if a heat engine with an efficiency of one is impossible, then a logical next question to ask is, what is the best efficiency possible for a heat engine? Well, if this were a full thermodynamics course, we would be able to derive this, but I'm just going to state it because we don't have a month to spend on this. There is such a thing as a Carnot heat engine, which is an idealization, which is the best possible. And it has an efficiency given by this formula. The easiest form to think of is just 1 minus Tc divided by Th, where those Ts are the temperatures of our hot and cold reservoirs. The Carnot engine is a theoretical thing which is unachievable in practice, although real heat engines can approach it. Nevertheless, it's useful for thinking about practical cases. A real heat engine will not have this nice simple relationship between the efficiency and the temperatures of the reservoirs, but it will have a relationship between them. It just won't be as simple as the Carnot efficiency. And the Carnot efficiency shows us something that is generally true of all heat engines. If we want to increase the efficiency of any heat engine, we can do it by either increasing the temperature of the hot reservoir or decreasing the temperature of the cold reservoir, or of course both. This is going to be useful for us in thinking about practical things like coal and nuclear plants.